anybody familiar with this uh, craze called the fidget spinner? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. So according to Wikipedia, the craze ended in June of 2017. So parents, if you're planning to get your kids one for the next school year or whatever, tell them it was so last year. But do we have a picture of one? I can't remember if I put one in. Oh, bummer. All right, so a fidget spinner basically has like a pivot and then it has like these ball bearings and you just like spin it and it just spins around. According to Wikipedia, again, it falls into the technical category of a useless machine because it creates all kinds of movement and does absolutely nothing except distract kids, which is supposedly helps them with distraction. That's how it's marketed. I don't know. But anyway, it's a fidget spinner. How many of you would say, my soul is kind of like that? If I'm honest, like in the middle of the week, I can be like that. Like just moving, moving, moving. My brain is going, my heart is going, and I'm not really accomplishing a whole lot there. I'm just, I'm just kind of like a fidget spinner. I don't know about you, but that can be me. And it is incredibly hard to just be still. It's like my soul has a bunch of ball bearings in it, and it just wants to keep on spinning endlessly, and it's the hardest thing in the world to just be still before the Lord. And Psalm 131, which is where we're going to be this morning, was written for us fidget spinners. So this morning, I'm going to be talking primarily to those who have put their trust in Christ already. But I want to say at the outset, um, peace and quietness of soul comes only in Jesus. And so this morning, if you do not have a personal relationship with Christ, and let me define that relationship. I mean, you have submitted and surrendered your life to Christ as your Savior and Lord. He is master of your destiny, Savior from the punishment for your sin. If that has not happened to you, the invitation is open for you to come to ask questions, do whatever you need to do to find out how can I get peace in Christ. But I'm, I am going to be talking primarily this morning to those who have already put their trust and faith in Christ. We're in Psalm 131, Psalm 131, a song of ascents of David. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Boy, do we ever need help with that, do we not? Well, I'd like to break down verse number one as we go through this, and I'd like to take it from the opposite standpoint. I feel like I'm really, really hot, by the way. I don't know if I'm buzzing, but I sound like to me like I'm buzzing. Um, so I want to take, it, take the first verse from the opposite extreme. So how to have a fidgety soul or a panic attack or a breakdown or you name it, whatever your thing is, fear, despair, anxiety, or just being flustered all the time. How do I do that? Well, first thing you need to do if you want to have a fidgety soul is forget that you're a pilgrim. You say, where in the world is he getting that from the text? Look back at the psalm. See that inscription at the very top? A, a song of ascent. Some of your Bibles might say a song of degrees. That's actually part of the inspired text of Scripture. And what that's indicating is that this is part of a chunk of psalms called the Psalms of Ascent. The psalms are like a hymnal, the hymnal of the people of God. And like modern hymnals, they're arranged oftentimes in a purposeful order. So they're not just thrown in there randomly. A lot of times reading psalms together gives you an idea of what that chunk of psalms is supposed to be communicating. Well, this chunk of psalms is called the Psalms of Ascent. What is that talking about? It's not ascent as in, yes, I agree with you. I'm just going to move. Maybe I'm sorry. Maybe I'm going to move forward. Um, that's not ascent as in this way, but ascent as in I'm going up. Because these were songs that would be sung as Israelites were going back for one of the many, many feasts of Jerusalem. Why did God want them to keep going back every year multiple times to Jerusalem? 
One of the reasons is God wanted the Israelites to remember that they were pilgrims. They weren't supposed to settle down and get comfy. They were on a journey. And New Testament believers, where are we headed? Hebrews and Revelation tell us we're headed to a new Jerusalem, also known as heaven, that we're marching toward that new Jerusalem. And so these songs of ascent remind us that we are travelers. And Jerusalem, by the way, just like we think of heaven as being up, Jerusalem was thought of as being the highest point in Israel. So even if you were north of Jerusalem coming into it, you were always going up to Jerusalem. So that's where the ascent is coming from. But this psalm is supposed to remind us that we are pilgrims on a journey. We're not to settle down. We're not to get comfortable. We're not to expect to get comfortable. But don't we do that? When was the last time you watched an HGTV show that dealt with real estate and the people were like, um, I want this house because uh, I'm going to have so many ministry opportunities in the neighborhood and it's really close to my church and it's just really going to help me please God living here. No, no. If, you're, if you've ever moved and you go on Zillow or Trulia or wherever it is, what do you look for when you look for a house usually? You look for how comfortable it's going to make you, right? Like, what are the amenities? How awesome is this going to be? And for most of us, the last thing we think about is, wait, I'm a pilgrim. How can I use this to minister, to use it for the Lord? And so we get comfortable. We expect to be comfortable. And then when something gets in the way of that, suddenly I'm a fidget spinner. My comfort has been disrupted. So if you want to have a fidgety soul, forget that you are a pilgrim. But now let's go into the text, uh, or the verse one rather. There are three, three things here that if reversed will help us have a fidgety soul. First one is, oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. What am I setting my heart on? What's interesting about this psalm, I, I was first introduced to this psalm uh, in our premarital counseling because I, as I've confessed, am a bit of a fidget spinner, and I can be fearful. And so the guy who was doing our premarital counseling said, why don't you memorize these three verses? And it was really good for me, because you know what this psalm teaches me? It teaches me that when I am fearful, oftentimes it's because I'm proud. My heart is lifted up. You say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. How does fear relate to pride. By the way, the first point, if it's not up there on the screen, is think too highly of yourself. If you want to have a fidget spinner soul, think too highly of yourself. How does that work? How does thinking too highly of myself result in fear? Well, let's think about this. When I'm thinking too highly of myself, I'm viewing my life as completely separated from God. He's not my foundation. He's not my shield. He's not my support. I'm just kind of out here all by myself, in my mind anyway. So therefore, when life becomes too overwhelming and I realize, oh, I can't do this because, newsflash, you can't. When I figure that out, suddenly I'm filled with fear. Or here's the other response, sometimes after the fear, oh, I am out here all by myself. I've got to control this. How dare you get in my way? How dare you mess with my plans? And anger comes out. So I'll respond either in fear or in anger if I'm viewing myself too highly and I'm thinking of myself as I've got to control this. I've got to control this situation. I've got to be in charge. So if you want to be fearful or anxious or angry, Think, of, think too highly of yourself. Think that you must keep you healthy and happy. You're the one on whom your happiness depends. You're the decider of your fate. You're the one who's got to put food on the table, supply all your needs. You're the one who's got to put clothes on your back. Think about the last time you were on vacation. And maybe your tire, let's say your tire blows out on the road. How do you tend to respond it's usually either, oh, no, what's going to happen? Or, oh, I can't believe it. We're supposed to be having fun. My tire is blown out. 
fear or anger come out because we're reminded on trips like that that we're pilgrims and we're not in control. And so if you want to have a fidget spinner heart, think too highly of yourself. If you don't want to think too highly of yourself, you might try getting captured by Filipino Muslim terrorists. In 2002, Martin and Gracia Burnham, many of you know, remember this story. In 2002, um, they were missionaries with New Tribes Missions in the Philippines, and they were captured by Muslim terrorists and held for ransom for a year. And uh, Gracia made it out of that situation, and 10 years later, she described the way they lived during that year. She said, we asked God for everything we needed. If we needed a drink of water, I asked God for a drink of water. And if we came to a stream, I drank the water. It didn't matter that it was dirty. It was water, and God provided it for us. Wow. Talk about an exercise in learning peace of soul, that I depend on God for everything, and that's okay. If you want a quiet, humble soul, surrender your plans to God, including, this is what I've learned. I don't know what it is for women, but for guys, a lot of times I tend to have a fidget spinner soul in the evenings or the weekends. When I've got plans of things that I'm going to get done and they get interrupted, because again, I'm thinking a little too highly of myself. But if you don't want to be that way, you might remember James chapter 4, where James says, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go into such and such a place and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What's your life? For you're a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. I'd read that passage a lot and not really thought much of it. I don't, I'm not a big guy of commerce, you know? I don't think to myself, I'm going to go to such and such a town next year and buy and trade and make a profit. But I do think, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I'm going to get this, 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 and this done. And when it doesn't happen... <laughs> I think too highly of myself. What does that verse says? say? It says, you're boasting in your arrogance. If you want to have a fidget spinner soul, think too highly of yourself. Thirdly, focus on the things that God has denied you. Look back at the text. Oh, Lord, my heart is not lifted up. I haven't set my heart too high. But then secondly, my eyes are not raised too high. I'm not looking at what God has said no to. In the words of Charles Spurgeon, this psalm is one of the shortest psalms to read, but one of the longest to learn. It speaks of a young child, but it contains the experience of an adult in Christ. Isn't that true? Have you ever been in a season, like I have recently, where all you wanted to do is focus on what God has denied you? The things He has not given you? The things that He has said no to? Yet, there's a, there's a legend told of a Puritan. Now, this is a legend. I don't know if it's true or not. But there's a legend told of an old Puritan who sat down to a table, and on the table, there was a dry crust of bread and a cup of water. And rumor has it that someone happened to walk by the window just as he was sitting down to this table, and he looked at what was on the table, and he said, all this and Jesus too. Think about that. If you've been given the Son of God, the all-sufficient Son of God, the riches of heaven, shouldn't we be able to be content if we have the bare necessities of life? Whew. Shortest psalm, longest lesson to learn. But, by all means, if we want a fidget spinner soul, crave, we should crave what we don't have. Don't think about Christ's sufficiency or goodness or promises or love for you. Just think about how happy you would be if, dot, dot, dot. All right, fourthly, keep yourself busy with things that you can't control. What's that third phrase in verse 1? I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. I don't keep myself busy with things that are in God's realm. They're not even under my control. But 
How often do we waste so much mental energy saying, what if this happens? Will I be safe? Will my family be safe? What if this happens politically? What if this happens uh, to my child? Uh, what about, what about, what if, what if, what if? I don't occupy myself with things that are too high for me. But wait, 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 wait. Okay, you say, um, I know I shouldn't do that, but I also know that at the bottom of it, I really just sometimes struggle to trust the goodness of God. Like, I know the whole, God is sovereign, He's in control, but I don't know if you've noticed, He lets bad things happen a lot. So how can I trust Him when everything in me says, I've got to control this? I want you to hold your finger in Psalm 131 and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. I came across, I've read this passage so many times, and yet, um, I'm sorry, Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5. I've read this passage many times, but it has never really struck me the way it did this week. I think because um, our family has just come through a season of extended pain that God allowed. And so Courtney and I have actually been talking a lot about trusting God when it hurts and when he does allow painful things. Because let's face it, trusting God doesn't mean you're not going to experience pain, right? So how do we reconcile that in our souls so that we're quiet about it? Well, Hebrews 5, look at verse 7. Hebrews 5, verse 7. This is just, this week at least, to me, this verse is amazing. In the days of his flesh, so when he was on earth, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Anybody ever been there? Again, having kind of come through a season where there was a lot of that going on in my home, uh, this verse stuck out. With loud cries and tears, to him who was able to save him from death, God the Father was able to stop the pain. And here's what's amazing. Look at the last phrase. But he wasn't heard because God the Father wanted to do his own thing. No, what does that last phrase say? He was heard. God the Son, the perfect sinless Son of God, was heard because of his reverence. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. God heard him and yet he still allowed him to go to the cross. See, this passage teaches us that deliverance from our Father looks a little different maybe than what we often think it is. Verse 8, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. How can God the Son learn something? Here's what I think this verse is saying. You can only learn obedience by actually physically going through it. You can't learn it conceptually. You can't just say, oh yeah, I understand the concept of obeying. No, the only way to learn obedience is to be told, do this even though it hurts, and trust me. That's the only way you can experientially learn it, is to do it. Verse 9, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Did God deliver him? Yeah. Was it painless? No. Did he trust and obey through the pain? Yes. Now back to Psalm 131. Okay, so we've looked at it in the negative. How do I have a fidget spinner soul? How do I have a, a noisy soul? Well, now how do I have a quiet soul? With Jesus as our example, how do I have a quiet soul? Verse 2. I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. There are, there's one picture here with two applications. I'm going to give you both of them at once. We're to trust and obey, like that old hymn. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. You say, what, what is this weaned child business? I don't, I don't understand that. Well, this is a, kind of an interesting picture, unless you have small children. Then you kind of begin to get it. The process of getting a child to switch from mom's milk to solid food is not pleasant, as these pictures will attest. There's Grant. There's Betts. 
and there's Freddie. <laughs> Not pleasant, because suddenly you're like, they're like, it was so comfortable. It was so good. And you're taking it away. And you're giving me this stuff that's green and nasty. I don't like this. And yet you as the parent know you got to do this. Like the only way to reach maturity is to get to this place where you can be sustained on solid food. And that's exactly what God does with us. I wish he did it a different way, but he takes away that which has been our comfort, our nourishment, and he does it so that we will learn to feast on him alone and to find comfort in his presence, not just in how he fills our stomachs. When Grant was, uh, when we first adopted Grant as a tiny, tiny, tiny infant, Courtney and I were both working, and so I got to split some of the feedings, and I learned a little bit what it is to feed a small infant. If that child is hungry, and you approach them with food in hand, it doesn't matter if you rock them, sing to them, bounce them, talk to them soothingly. It doesn't matter. Nothing is going to calm that child down until the food is in their mouth. And as Christians, as baby Christians, a lot of times that's how we are. God, God, you got to give me, 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 give me. And God wants us to get to the place where we find comfort in his presence and not just what, how he fills our stomachs. Because a weaned child sits on mom's lap and isn't going crazy, like, where's my next meal coming from? He or she is calm and quiet. Spurgeon writes, it's a blessed mark of growth out of spiritual infancy when we can forego the joys which once appeared to be essential and can find our solace in him who denies them to us. Whew. Shortest psalm, longest lesson to learn. So trust and obey. Thirdly, hope. Verse 3. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Hope. That's a choice. It is one of the hardest choices. If you are in a place where you want to run to despair, that can be a harder temptation to fight than lust. Because you just, you want to go down in that vortex. You want to just live there. And yet, the command is, this is a command, hope in the Lord. When I cannot feel Him, when I can't see Him, when I can barely think to process His promises because my brain is numb with pain, I will yet cling to Him. I will pray to Him. I will beg Him for grace. I will still obey Him. I will believe His promises are true. I will believe He loves me even when He actively crushes me. I will choose to trust and obey, and that is hope. I forgot to ask my dear wife if I can share this illustration, so um, hopefully it's all right. <laughs> she just gave me a thumbs up. She doesn't even know what I'm going to say. <laughs> so Courtney shared with me, uh, a lot of you know, she just, she's go come, coming out of a season of months of just excruciating pain, and she told me a story recently about it. I didn't even know this, but there was a time when um, she was sitting there in so much pain, and the thought came to her, the command is to give thanks in all things. <laughs> and at the moment, she was not super happy about that. Can anyone relate? So she's kind of like, okay, God, fine, thanks. Thank you for tile on the floor. Thank you for running water. And started out a little angry, but she obeyed her way into actual thanks. She got to a place where she was actually genuinely able to thank God for things. Sometimes, when you're in a place of hopelessness, you have to obey and behave your way into the, the right heart frame. Does that make sense? Sometimes you just have to trust and obey and hope and trust that the Lord is going to bring the feelings. 
Warren Wearsby says in the Christian vocabulary, hope is not hope so. It's joyful anticipation of what the Lord will do in the future based on his changeless promises. Like the child being weaned, we may fret at our present circumstances, but we know that our fretting is wrong. Our present circumstances are the womb out of which new blessings and opportunities will be born. So with our remaining time, I want to just share with you some stories of quiet souls. Because I'm firmly convinced that one of the things that helps us obey in situations like this is looking at the stories of others who've gone before and have done it, have hoped in the Lord, and he's met them there. So I want to share with you three stories of people who have trusted in the Lord. The first one, uh, her name is Mary Durand. Mary Durand, and I think we have a picture of her. Yeah, not a super happy looking woman, but when you hear her story, you'll know why. So, in the early 1700s in France, a 15-year-old girl was sent to prison. This is Marie. Her crime was holding the Huguenot faith. So, at that time, dissenting, the Huguenots were Protestant dissenters from Catholicism. And at that time, that was a huge, huge no-no. And so, the French authorities gave her the chance to recant her faith. And she said no. And so therefore, she spent the next 38 years of her life in a tower by the sea with about 40 other women, some of whom were in prison for actual crimes. And they were just kind of in this big room. They were often exposed to the elements. There was little sunlight that came in, except from this big hole that also let in the snow and the rain. From below, the smoke from the guardhouse would often come up for 38 years. She was in prison there. And yet, as a 15-year-old at first, she became the leader in this prison because she would lead women in singing hymns. And then after about 20 years, she got permission to get a psalm book, and she would read psalms to the women. 38 years years she did this. She was released finally eight years before her death. And on the wall, on the stone wall inside this, this prison room, we have a picture of this, is etched in French the word resist. <laughs> Carl Olson, who, who wrote about this story, said, we do not understand the terrifying simplicity of a religious commitment which asks Nothing of time and gets nothing from time. We can understand a religion which enhances time. In other words, makes your life better. But we cannot understand a faith which is not nourished by the temporal hope that tomorrow things will be better. To sit in a prison room with 30 others and to see the day change into night and summer into autumn. To feel the slow systemic changes within one's flesh, the drying and wrinkling of the skin, the loss of muscle tone, the stiffening of the joints, the slow stupefaction of the senses, to feel all this and still to persevere seems almost idiotic to a generation which has no capacity to wait and endure. Second story I want to share with you is probably familiar to some of you, and I know I've talked about them before, John and Betty Stamm who were missionaries uh, in the early, the first part of the 1900s to China. In 1934, the Red Communist Army was taking over the city that they were in. They were in their late 20s with an infant daughter. And there were constant rumors that the Red Army was coming. Well, finally, one morning, they became really urgent rumors. Like, no, they're coming. They're coming to take the city. And by that time, it was too late. John and Betty couldn't escape. And they were captured by, uh, by the communist army, forced to march with their infant daughter 12 miles. And their daughter barely escaped being killed on the way by one of the angry soldiers. And on December 6, 1934, John Stamm wrote this back to their mission station. He said, Dear brethren, my wife, baby, and myself are today in the hands of the communists in the city of Tsingte. Their demand is $20,000 for our release. Think 1934, how much that was. 
All our possessions and stores are in their hands. All our possessions and stores are in their hands. But we praise God for peace in our hearts and a meal tonight. God grant you wisdom in what you do and us fortitude, courage, and peace of heart. He is able and a wonderful friend in such a time. Things happened so quickly this a.m. We, they were in the city just a few hours after the ever-persistent rumors really became alarming so that we could not prepare to leave in time. We were just too late. The Lord bless and guide you. And as for us, may God be glorified, whether by life or by death. In him, John C. Stam. Peace in our souls and a meal tonight. Two days later, John and Betty were executed. And their daughter was hidden in a sleeping bag and miraculously saved by fellow Chinese Christians who got her to America where she grew up and was raised by family members there. But it just boggles my mind. They're like my age approximately with a small child. And he writes, there's peace in our souls. Wow. By the way, as a result of their story, many, many, many people flocked to the mission field in China to bring the gospel there. I want to share with you a third story. This one's more contemporary. You probably never have heard of this woman. Her name's Joy McLean. And uh, she's just an average American woman, middle class, you know, nothing super spectacular about her, other than the fact that um, she married a man who, after they, after they were married, became an alcoholic and then became abusive to her and her three children. And for 22 years, three of which she had to be physically separated from this man because of the danger to her and her children, she prayed for his soul and refused to give up. And she just kept praying for her husband for 22 years. And at the end of that 22 years, the Lord brought him to repentance and they renewed their wedding vows and they have a wonderful marriage today. They've even adopted a little boy from the Ukraine, and it's an amazing story of how God answered her because she waited. You say, okay, well, obviously not all of the stories you shared ended so happily. Sometimes when you wait for the Lord this side of heaven, because we're pilgrims, we don't visibly see how the Lord answers. I want to share with you two passages in closing to just help us with that. The first one's in James. Go back to James you can leave Psalm 131, um, James chapter 5, toward the end of your Bible, right before you get to First and Second Peter and First and Second Third John, James 5, in verse 7, James 5, verse 7. James writes, be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Be patient. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains? You plant that seed, it goes into the ground and it dies, and then you don't see anything until there's a resurrection of that plant. Verse 8, you also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. We forget that because to us, we're such tiny creatures that seem so far off. But it is at hand. Verse 9, by the way, do not grumble against one another while you're in the middle of this, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Verse 10, as an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. Say that with me. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. When you're in a time of trial and you say, I don't know when I'm going to see the end of this, if I'm going to see it this, end, this side of heaven, you've got to remember the Lord is compassionate and merciful, and his purposes toward you are for good. One more passage. 
Turn with me to Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64. The first part of this passage is one of our favorites here at Harvest. We even, uh, I think one of our songs talks about it. Isaiah 64 and verse 1. Maybe this is just a famous James McDonald clip. I don't remember where we've heard. I know we've heard. We've played this before. Isaiah 64, verse 1. We're going to go down to verse 4. Isaiah 64, verse 1. It's kind of like right in the middle of your Bible. Isaiah 64, verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Anybody there? Like, yes, I would love to see God just come down. What does it look like when he does that? That the mountains might quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries and that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down and the mountains quaked at your presence. God, we want to see it like the olden days when you made Mount Sinai rumble and you did stuff. It seems like you're not doing it right now. Verse 4, from of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts. For those who wait for him. Hope for the Christian is not a hope so. It's a settled conviction that God is going to act. That is the character of our God. There is not a God him who acts the way he does. But he acts for those who wait for him. So trust and obey and hope in the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, quiet our hearts, not just this morning, because it is quiet in this auditorium. And as we think on your promises and they're first and foremost in our minds, it's easy. It's easy to be quiet before you. But then the week begins and anxieties come and doubts creep in. So Lord, I ask you for something this morning. I ask that each and every day this week, as we as your people are faithful to seek you and to remind ourselves of your promises that Lord, you would meet with us. God, I pray for the weakest person in this auditorium, the one who is most feeble the one who wavers most often in trusting your promises, and I pray for that soul that this week you would sustain them, Lord. I pray that you would meet them in a mighty way and you would strengthen their heart, that your promises would become an anchor, a bedrock for their soul. God, may we as a church be a church that knows how to quiet ourselves before you and be content with what your providence has given us. And I ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.